Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Welcome everybody to another session of Conversations on Retail Asset Protection and Risk Mitigation broadcast. I'm your host, Brand Overston. Uh, I hope you know me. If not, uh, former recovering Walmart guy, uh, 22 years there, retired March 17, and I joined the Conversations on Retail podcast series, I don't know, maybe a year and a half ago. And uh, we've had a lot of rock star guests on our podcast from retail, from government. Uh, General Petraeus was one of our guests on transitioning military. We've had academics, we've had technologists. And this morning we're very lucky to be able to secure a uh, former vice president of Walmart Global Security, Steve Dozier. And I got to imagine a lot of people know Steve or at least have, have heard about Steve. Um, you were there. He'll go into more detail on his summary background. But Steve, I think you were there about 10 years, I guess it was. Just over. Yeah. So uh, Steve and I work closely together. As everybody knows, I was in the Asset Protection Division, was the primary staff director for a lot of years. So obviously, we work closely with Global Security. Um, and throughout the conversation, maybe we'll dissect how that's a different channel than Asset Protection and Global Security and how they complement each other as a force multiplier. But uh, Steve, thank you for joining us. Appreciate the time. I know you're busy. Um, if you would kind of give us a, a rundown on your background, because it's way more than just Walmart, even though Walmart is pretty significant. Yeah, well, thanks, Brian. And good morning, everyone. And um, I'm really uh, pleased to have been invited to join uh, your program, Brian. It's, uh, it sounds like it's a tremendous success and you have had some real noteworthy guests appear but yeah so um just a little bit about my background i was born and raised in jonesboro so north extreme northeast of arkansas um graduated high school i went to college at arkansas state university and obtained a bachelor's degree in criminology um, at that point you can see my interest of have started being peaked uh, in that direction. Um, I have to admit, I was a little anxious to to kind of get started. So throughout my life, I've always worked from you know typical you know preteen and teenage yep. jobs. I mean, I've done a little bit of everything. Um, I, I worked at a, a grocery store for a period of time, and those were days where you really, really uh, had a lot of task and a lot of a lot of jobs. It was fun. It was a great job. It, um, I was in high school then. Uh, worked at service stations and, you know, uh, a little manufacturing business. And, you know, so I learned how to use tools and work with my hands quite a bit. But um, eventually I started getting, I guess, a, um, a desire. I started recognizing there were some really great opportunities in public service. And so I was really, you know, young. I was probably 19 years old. And... I had a kind of a mentor of a, uh, you know, a lot of people have a favorite uncle, well, I did too, and and based upon uh, spending a lot of time with him, I, I got interested in, and I became an emergency medical technician in EMT, mm -hmm. and so I was still going to college when I started all of this, and um, I worked for for three years uh, at ambulance services in Northeast Arkansas. Really great experience, really, really kind of kicked off and gave me a great foundation. Again, the the gentleman I worked for majority of the time um, was just a, a, a an icon in the community and just had a big heart. And and those of us that worked for him um, still, you know, miss him today and, and really loved and enjoyed that time. Um, you know, EMTs. It was kind of the pre-paramedic days, and I actually had started a paramedic course um, to advance my skills when mm -hmm. uh, the law enforcement opportunities started coming along. So I left I left that world and became a deputy sheriff at the Craighead County Sheriff's Department. Again, it was kind of the older school days, if you will, and mm -hmm. and um, I was somewhat of a generational oddity most of those guys that i worked with were either world war ii or korean or vietnam veterans mm -hmm. and 
And so I was, I was kind of that young, young uh, test. I, I always felt like that's somewhat of a test case. And but in you know, in my mind, it wasn't that long ago. But in in actuality, it's it's been forty years. And uh, yeah. I was the first deputy in that county to ever attend uh, a state law enforcement academy. Prior wow. to that, a lot of law enforcement hands on. Uh, yeah. You had a a training officer and you know OJT so <laughs> OJT yeah yep. I mean I have to tell you the OJT I, I learned there was uh, <laughs> may have been more valuable than what yep. the academies actually yep. were teaching but um, you know a couple of things those days sheriffs in Arkansas were elected every two years instead of four and, and uh, this sheriff's been in office a long time, and he was like, Steve, I don't know how long I'll be here. You need to think about your future. So the Arkansas State Police, an opportunity came came up, and I was there about 27 years. And throughout my career, I was I started off in the Delta of Eastern Arkansas, the Mariana, Forest City, um, moved up into the Poinsett County areas, for those of you that are familiar with that. And so pretty rural, pretty down to earth, you know, Arkansans and, uh, again, a great learning experience. Um, my passion became criminal investigation. And so I spent a good many years, um, in that area and was involved in most all phases of, of investigative type work that the state was involved in then. Um, I had an opportunity again to promote into headquarters, and that's where my career really changed dramatically from kind of a field enforcement type of uh, trooper into into uh, leadership and management. And um, I was there uh, the remainder of my careers, uh, and and advanced up, had various jobs. And Governor Huckabee actually appointed me first. Uh, I served in an interim capacity twice while I was coming up, and and those are stories in and of themselves. But but Governor Huckabee um, promoted me to Colonel, and then when we had a transition leadership, Governor Mike Beebe then uh, uh, kept me in that role, and I served in, until uh, mid two thousand seven when when the Walmart opportunity. Uh, came my way. And again, a big dramatic life change, so to speak, but one that I felt ready for and I was excited about it. And and you're right, I was there 10 and a half years. It was a corporate role. So so I supported, I was in global security and we, we had a lot of security programs that various elements of the company were served from. And of course, you and I worked together on a lot of the Walmart US. Mm. Um, uh, safety and security type programs and asset protection needs. And uh, while I was there, I spent a year uh, in the international division, which was really tied to the international retail units. And again, a, a developmental type of uh, experience. And um, yeah, I was there 10 and a half years and thoroughly loved it and, and uh, felt like I had, you know, contributed, you know, quite a bit throughout the, changes um uh of those during those years you were there during uh, katrina right so i was at walmart during well i was at state police during katrina okay that was 2005 yeah um in 2015 walmart uh, asked me and i was very honored to speak bef uh, at a 10-year reunion um down in biloxi and gulfport um uh Former President Bush was there. Uh, I mean, a really uh, an elegant uh, commemoration and appreciation of those first responders um, that worked so hard during during those uh, uh, those events of 2005. Um, but yeah, so I tried to retire. Had an opportunity to join the Walton Enterprise team. Um, it's not that they were insecure, but they needed some formalization yeah. and some development of security themes, the majority of which was protecting people, but people and assets is kind of where I've, I've landed. Um, and I was there 
um, about three years. And today I'm I'm working part time. I'm, I'm working as a, a senior consultant for a, a local security and threat management company called Safe Haven Security Group. And, um, you know, I get teased a lot about, uh, I, I won't go away. I just seem to yeah. keep resurfacing. But, you know, that's just my nature. Like uh, I mentioned earlier, I, I worked hard. Uh, I watched my father work very hard throughout his life. And it's just a, a habit and yep. a, a way of life that I've uh, I've continued. So I I enjoy it. I I love the interaction with with people. And you know, it's funny, Steve, that your history almost parallels mine. Uh, yeah. When I was in high school, I was uh, started the ride along program with the Admiral County Sheriff's Department there in Charlottesville, Virginia. And again, <clears throat> it was OJT, not a very professional. You know, had the the sheriff who'd been there forever, and everybody knew him. Um, and so I was an EMT for a while, and then uh, they asked me to join the part-time force because I was 19, I guess. Um, and to me, that was absolute nirvana. That's all <laughs> I wanted in this life. And <clears throat> so I had a a mentor uh, that really helped me a lot in those early years, uh, both professionally and personally, and not saying I listened to everything he said, but you know, it's it's funny in mentorship. It may not matter at the moment, but maybe ten years later, the light bulb goes on, and I'm like, "Damn, that guy was right." Mm-hmm. Um, so I did that for a couple of years, and in my mind, my 19 year old mind, that's all I wanted to do. And I was hoping for a full time position, and uh, but mom had different plans. She uh, um, parents divorced when I was 10, I guess. Uh, mom uh, had very different plans. She said, you know what? Um, You're going to college. So you can be a police officer, but you'll do it after you graduate with a four-year degree. So this party's over. Um, And went to the University of Alabama. I was in community college when I was a uh, part-time deputy and worked like a dog. Anybody that paid me to work a, you know, football traffic or a stakeout or anything, I was there. Um, (laughs) And so anyway, I went to the University of Alabama. Criminal justice degree is what I still was very interested in. So I did that. And then, uh, you know, we were of very limited means. And my mom worked as the foreign training officer at the JAG school, Judge Advocate General, for people that may not know what that is. And so she put me in ROTC to compete for a scholarship. Because, again, it was out-of-state tuition. How she made it work. I had no idea. Um, But when I got into ROTC, before I knew it, I started liking it. You know, (laughs) to get there, I went kicking and screaming. I'm like, I do not want to be in the military. I want to be a cop. I want to. And then I started liking it. Went to summer camp at Fort Knox, Kentucky, fell in love with it and apparently did pretty well because when I graduated, I was, of course, commissioned as a second lieutenant in field artillery and selected for regular army commission, which means 20 years, just like an, uh, you know, an academy grad or those guys. It wasn't a reserve commission, it was active duty. So I never got the chance to return to law enforcement, um, but a very similar uh, background that you and I have never talked about. Uh, so that that's pretty cool. In your decades of experience, Steve, I don't know how many that is, and we don't date Too people many. on these calls. <laughs> particularly me, uh, what's changed in the physical security crime environment since you started? I'm going to guess in the 70s, late 70s. Yes, okay. 70s, exactly. What's, what's really changed that uh, makes you pause and think? Um, that's a great question. Um, the advancement of technologies, I think, is probably surprise a lot of us mm-hmm. because when you're in the moment you don't necessarily and you know and law enforcement we don't develop um, the technologies and and all of that yeah. but but we're uh, a benefactor and um time you know time you know goes by but i think a lot of the basic tenants um that you could talk about are probably still the same i mean when I was in college, they they taught the broken windows theory. Well, today, yeah. 
they're still teaching the broken windows theory. That's right. Um, when you protect people, you're still talking about lights, locks, mm -hmm. uh, you know, alarms and the cameras have evolved. Um, so a lot of the basic tools to protect and like in retail or, or business settings, access control, you know, that's, that has evolved. You and I both probably remember when, if you just had some kind of um, ID card hanging around your neck, you could just walk right in and you're immediately yep. trusted. You know, yep. <laughs> um, there, there was no scanning of the cards. There was no biometric yep. confirmation. There was no, uh, nothing like that. And, you know, that was just the, you know, there was a certain amount of trust that, that life required to get things mm -hmm. done. Well, today, there still is a certain amount of trust, but it comes differently, and it comes through all the evolution of technology. So you think about the facial recognition and the biometric reading uh, devices. Um, think about the analytics that cameras have today. I mean, literally, you don't even have to be recognized. The camera is going to recognize you and yep. tell, tell someone that brand has you know entered the office space so i think what is most impressive is throughout time i've encountered people who get somewhat frustrated with security if you will mm -hmm. and and you know as something that slows you down or just kind of this nagging thing you have to go through but i think the mindset of people today has changed considerably and a good many if not most of people that work in any setting today they expect their leadership to, to try to manage risk and take care of them you know they don't it's just kind of unheard of that um that your business just wouldn't provide you with a safe work environment yeah i um <clears throat> you know um, to your point retail is a good example of, you know, no matter how hard the technology arm of retail tries to, um, in my mind, sometimes introduce complexity. Retail has been the same thing. It's buying stuff and selling it for more than you bought it for. And the mechanics of retail have not changed. What though has changed to your exact point and relative to our audience in retail, um, you know, now today, so when I started at Walmart in 1995, <clears throat> Active shooter wasn't a thing. Our biggest, you know, threat was maybe a fight in the store on Black Friday um, when, you know, everybody crushes the door and all that, or slip, trip, and falls, fraudulent claims, and, of course, theft. But we didn't have that. And I remember um, uh, Larry Lundeen years mm -hmm. ago at Walmart when he was the safety guy under Monica Mullins, who was our VP, so that was... When was that, Steve? 2005, 2006, I guess? It was the early 2000s. Yeah. <clears throat> I remember Larry talking about active shooter, and that wasn't in my purview at the time. And I remember thinking to myself, what in the hell is this guy talking about? Really? That's our biggest problem? Yeah. And again, to my earlier point, looking back at it, Larry was way ahead of the curve. He was already thinking about protocols for active shooters long before the persistent phenomenon we're in today where it's almost commonplace. Uh, I don't know about you, Steve, but I suspect being a law enforcement uh, uh, DNA that you have, I, every time I go into a public venue, I'm always looking around, whether consciously or subconsciously, whether it's a Starbucks, whether it's a <clears throat> concert venue, uh, a Walmart store, I always have that just that little nudge to safety that I did not have, I don't know, 10 years ago. Um, but but the mechanics of retail now, if you ask any of the VPs, so Paul, all these names most everybody's familiar with, Kristen Keefe at Walmart, Monica Mullins, J.P. Suarez, uh, Mike Lamb, Paul Jekyll at Meyer Foods. Uh, Mike is now retired, but Mike was both well, all three, Home Depot, Walmart, and Kroger. Mm -hmm. In the last few years, in all of these uh, consulting engagements I do or going to conferences, in all my years in retail, 
safety would have been in the top three, but it was never number one. It was always shrink. And I can't put a date on it, but now when you talk to any of those executives, safety is number one. That is the biggest singular problem they face um, in all facilities, home office, distribution, store, certainly. Um, so did that? does that inflection align with what you've seen uh, being a police officer? You know, when you and I were a cop, I don't know how many times you pulled your gun. In two years, I pulled it once, and I didn't really need to do it then. <laughs> I just had, a, you know, we had a high-speed chase, and, you know, I was all whizzed up. And But now, uh, police officers, it's a completely different dynamic. So have you seen a kind of a parallel tipping point? I, I have. It's really interesting to hear you mention all those little points, but... So you're right. Larry Landine was um, a very forward thinking, is yeah. a very forward thinking leader. Yeah. But, you know, if you think about, are these shootings absolutely something new? They just started a certain date and time and a, fl a switch was flipped. Well, no. My theory is that they have expanded and, and the numbers have tragically just continued on. And it's not driven by any one thing. What you and I, to a great extent, know, what our families know, what our friends know, is mainly driven by the news cycle. And my gosh, if you set your alerts on your phone, there'll be multiple shootings get reported nationally every day. Yep. And it wasn't that you didn't have some of those in the past. But we know about them. We know um, a lot more about the whys and the, you know how uh, how these things could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, absolutely, you law enforcement today. My gosh, the risk and the threats. I don't know. If just yeah. in the last couple of days, I forgot. Forgive me. I forgot where, but there was a um, an ambush of an officer, yep. uh, and it was staged. Looked like some type of shooting at a residence and and then the the bad act the shooter uh staged himself uh where in the officer uh, because he you know that's what officers do they save people this guy looked like yeah. he needed some help thought it was related and he shot and killed just it just happened that quick the springdale officer um f a few years ago so the mental health issues in this country um are at the top of my mm -hmm. list of risks and it's not necessarily because that's anything new, but it seems to be that, and I'm no expert on this, but it just feels to me like um, the lack of viable treatment options mm -hmm. is greater than it has ever been. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when the authorities tell you that the number one mental health treatment facility in the United States are the prisons— that yep. you know, that scares me, and and it it continues. Um, but as far as uh, being, well, I'm I'm one. I I, have, I usually have to put my back to to a wall so I can see the doors mm -hmm. and watch people. And you know, again, it, when I was young, I was taught, you know, if somebody's going to hurt you, it's going to come from their hands. So I yeah, I exactly. pay a lot of attention to people's hands, you know. And it's just it, you know, it's it's the way I was. Um, just socialized to from a young age and and I continue it today. But but yeah, it's um the randomness of all of this is something else that's just so hard. But the the shock factor, I will tell you, uh when I was with ASPCID, we uh, we had been to the uh, a group of us had been in the fire. Explain that acronym, Steve. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So the criminal investigation division. So was Arkansas State Police Criminal Investigation Division, I was assigned at that time in Jonesboro out of a yep. out of a group there. And we uh it was we were all at the firing range and along with some local troopers. And uh, about the time we returned to the office is when we received the call to respond to the West Side Middle School, which was a Jonesboro affiliated um more rural school. And I became heavily involved in in that investigation and the follow up and and, uh, you know, I still think about it today. It's been, that was in 1998. 
but mm. such a tragic situation and just the kind of the uh, stress and the lifelong uh, mental health impacts on those that were so closely uh, involved in that. That was, you know, that's in 1998. That was the first time I remember um, state police. We as an organization, we said, okay, we need uh, some mental uh, counseling, if you will, just to talk about what we yeah. saw and what we experienced, how we felt. And it started being okay for police officers to say, you know, I'm, you know, I'm shocked. Yeah, I need help. I'm, I'm hurting, and and so that has really changed law enforcement significantly. It's okay to let people know when you're not feeling, you know, uh, mentally as healthy as you should. Yeah, it sure wasn't when uh, I was a deputy. It was more the bravado, <laughs> yeah. and you know, fatalities, and you know, how does that not affect you? You know, I, I remember one accident. It was teenagers, so I was myself still a teenager, and it was a horrible car accident kids just doing what kids did and uh very serious injuries one of them was paralyzed uh and i remember getting back you know once the ems team showed up there's like eight kids a couple of uh, ejections out of the car mm. and i remember getting back in the patrol car and i was just quiet you know even though my trainer my, my mentor you know, it, it was another day at the office for him. And when we would have accidental shootings with children playing with their parents' guns up in Louisa County, we mm -hmm. went there. Most gut-wrenching thing I've ever witnessed in my life. And to your point, it wasn't okay to talk about it. We would mm -hmm. go to dinner after that, and you just kind of, doesn't sound right, muscled up and just, you did what right. you did with it, compartmentalize and move on. Right. Um, in these instances of active shooters and, and i'm i'm glad you mentioned that because it, it you know sometimes our, our instinct particularly in a in a political sense is to oversimplify and say it's with this one thing and i can solve that one thing and in my mind it's a cocktail to exactly what you just said and i spend a ton of time as you may know steve i'm on the board at university of alabama and i'm down mm -hmm. there every semester and I speak to anywhere from three to 300 to a thousand students uh, in classes, career opportunities, what is life really like? Not, you know, <laughs> not what the posters tell you, come work for us, but what are the realities? And it's so encouraging to hear those students talk about and recognize the toxicity and the risks associated with not just social media, but digital information. And, you know, the, the, in the middle and the mental health, uh, that it, it, I have one student, actually, he's now an intern at Walmart, uh, started yesterday, an Alabama grad, and he's trying to create a program very similar to, we've all heard about dry January where, you know, everybody swears off the booze for a month. You feel better. And hopefully it's a trend. He wants to start a no social media February. And it's gaining traction on the Alabama campus. And I was surprised because I thought it'd be a hard sell with kids because, I mean, let's face it, <laughs> you know, it, yeah. it's an extension of their hand mm -hmm. and, and adults, too. So I'm not picking on the youngsters, um, but they realize it, that they're actually wanting to go back to what you and I called dumb phones back in the day, text and voice. And that was it. Um, so. It is that, it is the amplification and incessant news cycles of the active shooting. So we remember uh, El Paso uh, mm -hmm. at Walmart and how many ever fatalities, 20 odd fatalities there, right. stays in the news cycle for a long time. And right. if you think about the psychological effect, it begins to wear on you. And it's almost to the point now where we begin to view active shooter events as tragic, but you know what happens every day. Right. And I hope it's not me. Um, the technology. So let's shift over to technologies for that. And you're familiar with all of these in the physical security space. The the artificial intelligence through existing camera networks that can not only read license plates. I'm sure maybe even mm -hmm. Arkansas was using those or is using those um, to uh, being able to detect um, guns at a distance that gives you reaction time to do lockdowns or evacuations, whatever. Um, 
do you see an adoption? A, a are you please? Are you please is not the right word. Are you encouraged? That's what I'm looking for. Are you encouraged by corporate environments, not just retail, adopting these technologies to thwart or to minimize the damage, or do you still see a resistance to, hey, it probably won't happen here, we don't need to spend that money? What are you seeing? More adoption or more procrastination? Yeah, that's a good question. And of course, the cop-out answer is I see both. But yeah. <laughs> again, I think the mindset that is taking over for a lot of the reasons we've talked about um, is whose responsibility is it? So. Any business, retail or otherwise, that think the your local police have time to think about you, your business, your risk, form up these response plans, you're mistaken. I mean, yep. I think that all leadership needs to think about, you know, if, if we don't do this, who will? And and someone has to take charge. And so I, the resistance in the past largely has been driven by the desire not to frighten your workforce, right? Interesting. Now the workforce is already frightened. I, yeah, I, oh, you yeah. Know, you know. <laughs> They're already and scared. So, and so what I've been finding is many people that join in, at various businesses I've been involved with, they they start out asking, you know, what's our emergency plan? Where do I go if there's a you know tornado if you're in yep. northwest Arkansas? Um what if what if there's a shooting or you know they they're starting to ask these questions and um i noticed something um well my context is walmart and but i think they'll be proud of this and they've forgotten about it and they probably see a lot more of it today but some of our first active shooter drills or training if you will uh uh, took place at st taking place at store level, and it was done via uh, probably like a, a video uh, recording mm -hmm. that was playing uh, shown during meetings, and in well, some cases TV it was probably something. some live training. Yeah, to, yeah. Um, I traveled to a couple of stores after some events had happened, and events that were very similar to active shooters or were active shooter you know scenarios, mm -hmm. and. More than once, I had associates tell me that, well, I went in and found a back room. I closed the door. I scooted a metal desk to block the door, and I turned off the lights, and I, and, and they would say, just like the, the video told us to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, they're paying attention. They're learning. You know, that stuck. Now, is that across the board? Who knows? But over time, it will be, I, I, you know. Sure. And, um, I would say that if businesses are worried about frightening, you know, scaring their workforce, it's too late for that. Your, their children are receiving very similar training in it with a Great soft point. touch um, in schools today. Yep. And, and and now look at your religious facilities. How many of them have armed guards or at least have yep. emergency plans in case there's a, a shooting? I mean, it's 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 everywhere. No one's immune. Um, I will tell you that um, Gavin DeBacker, if you're familiar with him, he wrote a book, Gift of Fear. And he wrote it a long time ago, but he's continued to be a practitioner. It's just highly respected. And um, I was listening to him recently, and he was um, talking about um, this very issue of of training people and, you know, worry, being worried about frightening them. And his assurances related to mathematically your chance, your chances of being caught in a shooting situation or, or any act of violence mm -hmm. mathematically is pretty small. So he, he really talks about the, how the news media probably continues to instill fear he didn't say it was deliberate, but it you know that's what it's doing. But in reality, he was encouraging all of us to go on with our lives. Don't you know? Take your trips and go to your concerts and just you know live your life. But again, 
he his whole theory is about using your fears to peak your uh, instincts and your know, yeah. know when it's time to leave, know when it's time yeah. to take some uh, you know evasive action or something like that. And uh, there's several um, authorities today that are that teach a lot of threat management related um, themes and topics. Mm-hmm. And uh, but that one just kind of stuck with me, and and uh, and I just thought of it. But um, again, to kind of to your point, I I think the reality is it may be hard. It's hard to devote time. It's hard to devote energy. It may be taking away from other focus. But if you simplify your your messaging and your and your uh, training and mm-hmm. knowing that these associates or you know employees they they could benefit at work they could benefit at home at while they're out shopping they could benefit anywhere in their lives by some of these safety tips that just a lot of people have never thought about before. Yeah, that's a that's a great point about the kids. You know, I was <clears throat> I'm a too young to have experienced in elementary school the duck and cover from the mm-hmm. nuclear drills, but we did have fire drills. And I remember going home and we lived in a two story house, and, you know, Smokey Bear came and talked to us. And I was all worried about being able to, you know, get out of my bedroom, try to get my mom to go buy one of those, you know, ladders that rolls that. Oh, gosh. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> you're absolutely right. I mean, that, that party is over of saying we don't want to offend or instill fear because it's, unfortunately now commonplace, how does that translate to something I've been curious about? And and we went through this in the late 90s uh, at Walmart when we started parking lot patrols. And Mm -hmm. long story short, it turns out to be duty of care. So if we're doing something in one store, and again, this was the late 90s, we weren't nearly as sophisticated as we became over time with analytics and data. And you remember, we used to do the stores by tiers and threat assessments. You helped us with all that stuff to be able to get a grip on. It ain't cookie cutter. Not every store has the same risk. So you don't need to spend all those resources. So as parking lot patrol, we had an incident. And then that was really the first introduction to when some I'll be nice and say a lawyer, uh, you know, came back and said, wait a minute, you had parking lot patrol in the Jonesboro store. Why didn't you have it in North Little Rock? Because the incident happened at North Little Rock and had you done that and then it goes to pot from there. Do you see duty of care now helping these uh, commercial entities, if you will, again, not specific, just retail? Uh or is duty of care still kind of a remote threat to make a company spend money to put in technologies that you're right? It may be a one in a million chance, but man, when it happens, it's hundreds of millions of dollars uh, right. cost. Do you see duty of care helping make decisions or is that still a remote concern? You know, uh, that's interesting. Uh, I think in some cases, leadership maybe feels compelled because of that little clause of duty to to care. But I think if you've got a workplace environment and culture that just naturally cares about people, it's probably easier than otherwise. I I always felt bad for the smaller businesses and things like that because it will break the bank. Sure. uh, If you do everything you think you, you can think of. But Back to that duty of care, you know, that that concept has been around a long time. Mm-hmm. But I think today probably, and this is just me, but more than ever, I think that um, it's taken a little more seriously. I think it kind of gets your attention and makes you think, so, you know, it really it is our responsibility to to make sure that that fire door is not blocked and people get trapped That's in right. that area. Um, it really is. You know, and so how do you get that done? That's the hardest part. But um, anyone, you know, my advice is anyone who thinks they're just going to ignore the concept of duty of care, um, better better think about it a little a little differently. Because I, there's a couple of things that's happening. Like to to me, I was deposed last year on an, on some incidents, and duty of care that 
phrase came up in line of questions constantly. And so if yeah. if if the business isn't thinking about it now, the plaintiff's attorney will remind you at some point in time. <laughs> but you can bet on that. <laughs> you can count on it. Um, but, you know, I think uh, so many businesses today are thinking about, you know, it's kind of that do the right thing. And it's unfortunate because, I mean, uh, when you see someone go through a risk assessment and the vo- the volume, the lines of risk that people that you can think of are are enormous. Mm-hmm. And so how do you prioritize? How do you, you know, decide what is the most important thing to do? Because, um, you know, I was told by a very, um, a wonderful senior leader uh, years ago, she, she told me, she said, Steve, you know, all good things won't get done. And that's just kind of a fact of life. I find that true with, with everything. So you have to really prioritize and want to get things done. I mean, you think about our experiences when, when we really were um, motivated or or we had the desire to really co- accomplish something, we can do great things. That's right. But there's so many things that distract from from that focus. So, but I, but I think the the duty of care uh, helps. I will tell you. I don't know if you've noticed it, but there's a law firm in Arkansas that advertises statewide on television, seeking clients who have been injured or um, harmed at mm-hmm. uh, while shopping in retail stores. Doesn't name any stores. Wow. But, but, and then I was in, I think I was in North Carolina with my son. I heard the same thing on, on, on television there. So it's becoming, these attorneys seem to be aware that everyone is more concerned about, you know, accidents in stores. I mean, years ago, if, you know, if, if you weren't hurt, hurt bad, you know, you didn't. Yeah. You didn't sue anybody. You didn't want the store to, you know, you didn't file a claim. You just, you know, you went on and, and but today I think there's just everyone is so uh, self aware. Yeah. Um, about things that go wrong in stores. I remember, you know, years ago uh, in the officers' meetings. So for the audience, <clears throat> the auditorium there at uh, Walmart home office and, Every Friday morning, two, three hundred officers packed in the auditorium. Of course, David Glass was our CEO back then, and I remember um, a very, a very different environment because uh, Mr. Glass was um, very specific, not a man of many words, but boy, he sure made a point. Uh, and it would generally silence the room full of people when he would yeah. make a point because he was mm-hmm. absolutely right. Great guy. Uh, but to your point, being able to focus, so accidents was our biggest thing. And, you know, mm-hmm. I'd get up and talk about shrink, and everybody's like, you know, boo, and the million-dollar shrink stores. <laughs> the poor regional vice president would have to get up, and he'd tap dance some excuse that would not cut the mustard. Right. He'd get right. riddled, sit down. But the accidents. And when we focused on it, when it got brought up in the officer's meeting and the CEO of the company made a point, guess what? Accident numbers plummeted the next, you know, four, five, six weeks until right. we took our eye off the ball again. Right. And the cycle repeated, no different with shrink or anything else in business. And one of the analogies I use, you know, comparing when I was talking to General Petraeus, uh, he kind of put a question to me, what do you see as the biggest difference? You've made the transition from active duty. You were in Afghanistan combat zone. What's the difference between that and mm-hmm. civilian? I said, of anything course there are many but if anything in the military we never struggled with what was critical versus what was important that mm-hmm. never got cloudy we yeah. knew as in my case as an artillery officer safe and accurate delivery of munitions you could not screw that up right. and uh error free nuclear operations because we could deliver mm-hmm. tactical nuclear rounds and if you screwed that up best case scenario your career was over worst case you got court martialed so you yeah. didn't screw that up. Um, Everything yeah. else, we knew what was important. And then we also knew uh, what was routine. I struggled with that in my civilian career. We, you know, as I used to tell Paul Jacob when he was my boss, and he'd laugh, say, Brian, you don't have to say everything that you're thinking. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I always said on active duty, you have a choice as a leader. You can do 100 things half-assed or 10 things really well. Take your pick. And 
we always struggled with that focus. So, you know, that was my point kind of with duty of care is that bringing the importance of that, even though the chance of an active shooter in 4,700 mm -hmm. stores is very remote, mm -hmm. when it happens, it is not a footnote of risk. It's a no. major calamity, very expensive and reputationally damaging. Because people like me, when I go into any public forum, even a Starbucks, and I see a guy with a gun, if he hadn't got a badge on his belt, if he's civilian right. clothes, I'm out. I leave. Yeah. I, I just, you know what? I get to a, I get, you know, individual rights, but mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on in that guy's head. Right. Uh, so I leave. I'm like, honey, yeah. I'm out. See you. Yeah. I'm not doing this. His, his intentions, you can't predict his intentions. Ooh. So Heck it's no. best just to just leave it alone and um, hopefully he'll go away or the, or the authorities will, will come talk to him and see what's up. But Exactly. I, uh, you know, and, and students, I think about that when I'm, you know, in the bigger classes at University of Alabama, there'll be 200 kids in those auditoriums and we're talking about careers. My back is typically to the doors and the students are there in the kind of, what do you call it? The, the venue, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And it's very much in my mind. I'm like, we are screwed. Because the only way out is the same way the guy comes in. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, um, Steve, you're you're what I would classify as a threat management SME. And for those in the audience may not know what that acronym is, subject matter expert. You've got 40 years in the saddle, a culmination of a myriad of experiences uh, from police officer to corporate and you, let's face it, you were a major player in the world's biggest retailer in that space. Um, what, how do you, if, if I'm a listener right now, and I've just been promoted to a position of uh, physical security, corporate security, whatever, uh, at a major company, wh where do I start? What do I do to be able to get, you know, it's more than padlocks. It's more than, you know, a couple of signs. How do you begin to develop a strategy? What's your best advice on that to help that newly promoted person? Yeah, um, and, th and that's a great question because let me just start out by saying, you know, if you think about a definition of security, think how many things that can be. I, I made a list one day on a whiteboard just to look. I mean. You know, and you've got all the different um, kind of practices of you know the cybersecurity and and oh, good point and sundry. So, but I would say that my focus primarily for years now has been protecting people, people and assets. But people always are your are going to be your probably your greatest priority. But so so you need a, a strategy, right? Well, I always give advice that, so what is it that you're most concerned with? So lead them to a bit of an assessment. It can be formal or it can be informal, but kind of list what you think your risk and risk from what? Well, like at Walmart, we did a lot of risk assessment, but it was risk to the business. And so I would always, you know, step down Great and I think about risk to the associate's to operate the business, you know, successful and things like that. But just if we simplify this to just to kind of fit the scenario that you just mentioned. So you're, you're, you're walking a facility, you're responsible for protecting people and, and you don't have anything. Well, you really need to conduct an assessment and you really need to conduct a little bit more of a, a professional assessment that considers a host of information and, without going into, into any of those details, you know, throughout that process, you'll start seeing certain things, certain risk will rise rise to the top. Uh, but I'd say at a, you know, the, the kind of the base level is that you're always going to lock your doors. Um, you're always going to have some type of access control system that gets people mm -hmm. in and out and people you want in and those you don't want to keep them out. Um, for 
many reasons, cameras today have pretty much become a base, you know, whether it's uh, to clarify an incident, an accident, or um, if you have some intruder, you know, that you need to identify or something like that. There's a lot of reasons to have camera systems. Uh, do you need to jump into perimeter alarms and cameras and an operations center where you monitor your um, triggers that have been set? Uh, to help identify movement in certain areas and things like that. Well, maybe not, but but maybe you do. So that's kind of the the f- the future uh, of where a lot of perimeter security is going. Because again, in the security world, you would much rather have layers. You know, concentric rings is what some security experts will tell you. So that. Maybe the parking lots are, are somewhat secured and and you get checked in and out of a parking lot. And that's just, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah. But then as you're approaching the office, um, is there another uh, barrier, if you will, to impede those that shouldn't be there, even if it's just a visible guard, um, a visible police officer or, you know, I'm. I hate to mention signage because, you know, a lot of people don't like signage, but, you know, people see that and they read it and, you know, mm-hmm. reinforces that, okay, there's some type of surveillance. There's a camera that's kind of watching here for security purposes. Um, but, I, you know, I, and I think as you build in, then once you're inside, once you're, we trust you, come inside. To have a well-rounded program today, you really need to think about those trusted insiders who have access, what type of access. So then you start getting into a lot of the technical um, IT related um, firewalls and barriers and things to keep, you know, you know, I don't need to get into the CEO's uh, payroll information, you know, that sort, but it's more than that. So there's certain secure areas that there's no reason for anyone who doesn't have the credentials to pass through there. So, you start you start building that out on the inside, but more than that, really getting into threat management. Uh, I would say in business operations, um, one of the primary uses of a, of a behavioral threat assessment is prior to a termination, a, and not every termination, but it's those terminations where someone has voiced a concern. Maybe multiple people have voiced a concern as to how this individual may react to the news that they're losing their mm-hmm. job. And so, you know, a bit of an assessment will help those who deliver the message, HR. And by the way, these behavioral threat assessments today, HR is a very active partner in those. And many companies are starting to train their HR teams uh, to conduct these behavioral threat assessments. Um can a novice do them? Well, yes, but truthfully, experience matters. And so I would say on your really tough cases, cases where it's more than just a feeling, uh, you've had someone act out or demonstrate or have been arrested for um, domestic violence or something like yep. that. You know, let a professional help you with that because, again, we always uh, tell our threat assessors that, you know, you're – you're being asked to make a prediction and that's hard with humans. And so the kind of the profession, if you will, for many years has studied this and they've developed a list of correlates and they're quite a few, but there's things like, you know, does, does this person blame others? Has this person had, um, um, a very traumatic life, um, life experience like, a death of a close family member, a divorce, um, a job loss. I mean, it can be a host of things. But as you and it gets numerous. It talks about a little, you know, mental health history. You know, it talks about different things. And I mean, this is an assessment. It's not you're not profiling. Race yeah. and demographics have nothing to do with it. But most all of us might check th- three or four boxes and don't worry about that at all. But when yeah. you start getting above of you know uh and you're checking multiple boxes here that doesn't mean that anything bad's going to happen but it means you need to look a little deeper and you need to you know you need to talk to people people that have um a vantage point to know 
how this person's doing, how they're reacting to things in life. And so, again, don't mean to get too deep into that, but um, those, the time you spend doing that, most of the time, everything's going to go as planned and nothing to worry about. But you may uh, take precautions that prevents. Uh, so, for instance, you know, I've seen companies that um, there's so many of these correlates. Or so, and th- those are also known as warning signs. There's so many of them that the persons delivering the messages aren't comfortable. So yeah. they might deliver it by phone, which I don't like. And a lot of people don't like, but mm-hmm. it's kind of a last resort. You know, if you, you know, you got to get this done yeah. and do it over the phone. But also with everything I'm talking about, use your security resources because, again, you kind of repeat that step of Mm -hmm. access control again. Mm -hmm. So making sure that they don't have the ability to return to the workplace and things like that. So a lot of detail, but I hope you answered the question. The strategy, so that in my simplest terms would be the strategy is going to to kind of encircle, if you will, um, your risk that reside in the middle. And uh, you may need three or four um, components, or you may need all eight, uh, you know, to, to satisfy your strategy that you're attempting to accomplish. Yeah, I, you know, as one uh, quick one, you know, you mentioned terminations. And, mm-hmm. you know, that at a minimum is always going to be, to some degree, emotional for both the receiver and the giver. Mm-hmm. Um, and the only it time is. I ever had it, and I guess it was your big security guys, um, this guy had exhibited violence. Uh, he came in through his backpack in the mm-hmm. office and scared a couple of the other coworkers. Mm-hmm. And my VP at the time, Monica Mullins, great lady, um, she'd very quick make a decision, said, he's fired, get him out. And HR, of course, came in and tried to do the whole softening touch. She's like, nope, don't care, fire him. So we hauled him in and I'm like, Monica, I want a couple of good old boys outside the door in case this goes crazy because he's already exhibited violence and not that I can't handle it, but you know, it'd be better if there were disinterested parties to be able to handle this. And so two big, (laughs) two big guys were outside the innovations conference room, delivered the message and it was fine um, because he was stunned. Uh, But I'm like, you know, we don't do that, dude. Sorry, you're out. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, uh, you know, and then back in the day, I remember, you know, it did 95, 96 at Walmart headquarters. And I'm, I'm not going to get into specifics because it is physical security strategy. But, mm-hmm. you know, openly, I could walk anywhere in that building. And I shared a mm-hmm. coffee pot with the CEO, David Glass. We'd have a quick chat at the coffee pot there on Executive Row when our offices were down there. The only badge access you had was a uh, a card at a little you know badge reader outside mm-hmm. the door. It doesn't mean it was me. It just means that badge said it was okay for you to come in, and I right. could go anywhere in that facility. Now, obviously, it's a lot different for a lot of good reasons. But um, so, Steve, I want to spend the last uh, we have like two minutes. Um, so. Unless you disagree, I'd like to invite all the listeners, because Steve, typically, you know, when this goes out on YouTube and Spotify, wherever it goes, that's where we get a lot of viewers. Um, Okay. Because obviously everybody's at work today. So, um, but you are in the consulting business. You are a senior advisor, if the term's correct, with Safe Haven, uh, which is a Dentonville-based firm. Um, Retired. Uh, former vice president at Walmart Global Security and 20 odd years at the Arkansas State Police. So uh, is your contact info out on LinkedIn or somebody? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, Okay. uh, Yeah. One of our, one of our internet connections got a little unstable, but yeah. So as far as contacting me, uh, um, the simple email address okay. uh for safe haven and i monitor re- really closely uh okay. even though i'm just you know part-time but I, I i will take anyone's call but it's steve at safe haven security dot com. yeah and i would encourage people safe i haven mean especially the ones you know that may find themselves in this what in the hell do i do now that i have the job 
because <clears throat> guys, Steve has forgotten more than most professionals know about this kind of space and can certainly uh, give you some parameters and some you know guidance on how best to attack it. A uh, bit whether it's something as opaque as business continuity <laughs> that includes a lot of stuff. Wow. all the way down to the more finite of uh, physical security and controlled access strategy. So, um, Steve, I want to thank you, buddy, for your um, hour and our discussion and uh, wish you a great rest of the day and super glad you didn't have any storm damage um, here in northwest Arkansas. Um, so greatly appreciate it and have a good rest of your day, Steve. Thanks very much. Well, I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Brian. I've enjoyed it. And like I say, happy to talk to anyone. And as far as safe haven security group, anyone's first call, you know, with a question, there's no, we're not going to bill anyone that has questions or wants to talk about needs or just some simple advice. So always happy to help. So always. thanks again. And uh, good luck to you. I think we've learned a lot about one another here this morning. Yeah, that was, that was quite cool because I haven't spent a lot of time with you since no. Walmart. And that was 10 years ago for it's me been anyway, a while and, almost. And we're always so busy. We just talk about work, but, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Brad. I hope you get okay. the bike ride in today. I think this afternoon, the weather is going to be better. Uh, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Take care, Steve, man. Appreciate okay. it, buddy. Thank okay. you. Thank you. See ya. Bye.